Uh, so first of all, uh, thank you and welcome uh, um, everybody. And thanks for inviting me here to give a talk. And as Brian was saying, this talk is going to be about my PhD work um, during the past five years at the Open University. But I would like first to mention about uh, my position here now as a postdoc for the Sketch project. Um, started two months ago and um, working with uh, Jason, Jason Freeman from the Center uh, of Music Technology and Brian Majerko um, from the Digital Media um, Department. And basically, your sketch is a com um, computer science learning environment uh, that allows students to learn computer science principles by making music. And the main objective is to broaden, broaden participation in computing. And so this aligns with the research on musical tabletops that I will present today, which also in a way broadens, broadens participation in computing. Now, um, my supervisors were Robin Laney and Chris Dobbin from the Open University in the UK, and Sergi Jorda from the Universitat Pompeu Fabra, where I did my master's. And this talk will have three main parts. Uh, part one, I'll present the research context and a bit about the motivation of the work and some background. Uh, in the second part, I will um, present, say, three empirical studies that uh, we conducted. And part three will be like an epilogue just um, summarizing the implications of this work. Now, musical tabletops, what they are. Um, you can see them as a subset of interactive tabletops, which are um, table-shaped artifacts that are computationally enhanced, and so you can manipulate the content by a multi-touch interaction or tangible interaction that is working with uh, tangible objects on it, and in this case to manipulate uh, music, musical content. Now here we can see two well-known examples of interactive uh, tabletops for music performance. On the left, there is the AudioPad, which was developed at the MIT. And it's a more DJ style based um, table in which you can load a set of samples with the objects. And then there are all types of objects that allows you to operate, uh, apply some filters on, on these samples. Now on the right, we see another example, which is the Reactable, developed at the Music Technology Group in Barcelona. And it's a virtual modular synthesizer with a tangible and multi touch interface. And so there are a set of objects that, um, including sound generators, filters, controllers, that you can interrelate inter between them and create um, musical compositions too. And so as you can see here, um, these systems tend to be quite bulky, which prevent them to be moved easily, but also they uh, promote collaboration. Now, the thesis um, approach um, is, is basically interested in understanding the nature of collaboration with these devices, and in particular, focusing on the social and interactional aspects. Now, this illustration represents, in a way, the stance of the thesis, which basically, if we imagine the musical tabletop and a group of users interacting around it, <clears throat> they are creating music together. Um, typically, um, pre or predominantly, there is nonverbal interaction, nonverbal communication, and then we have the audience observing this interaction. Um, it's similar to the approach of, of the research stance of this thesis. The main approach is an ACI approach about um, evaluating existing systems in order to inform next generation design. And, and so, as I mentioned, I will present three empirical studies, two with the reactable in, in the two target contexts of these um, devices. One is the professional setting and the other a museum, museum context. And then a third study, which is a more experimental study trying to solve some, the, some of the issues that we identify in the other two studies. Now, the context of this research is twofold. One is um, the third wave in HCI, and the other is the evaluation area at NIME. And I will unfold these two items for you. So how many of you have heard about this first, second, and third wave in HCI? Okay. 
right? So just to summarize very briefly, but this is an open co or an open conversation in the Kai community about these three waves um, that they appear sequentially over time, but they coexist together. And so the first wave is basically more about uh, focusing on the human factors and the ergonomics of, of a system. And so um, it's interested in, in understanding the efficiency of a technique or a system, or for example, the errors that a user can do. Now, the second wave is more interested in humans as, an act, as actors, and it borrows um, methods from cognitive science and the questions are more about the communication between the system and, and humans. And there are also studies in the workplace uh, trying to understand uh, groups of users interacting with different technologies. Now the third wave uh, appears with the advent of a range of technologies ranging from uh, interactive tabletops, tablets, mobile devices, ubicom systems. <coughs> And so the use of these systems in a range of situations and by a, a number of, of groups of users. And so there is this term called embodied interaction, coined by Paul Durish, which basically is a theoretical perspective that allows us to understand the social and interactional aspects of these, these interactions with these novel technologies, uh, focusing on um, the construction of meaning in, in, in group. Now, the other aspect that um, is relevant here is evaluation at NIME. NIME um, stands for New Interfaces for Musical Expression, and it's a well-known conference in music technology that happens every year. Um, it can be seen as a spin-off from CHI because it started there in the early 2000s. And what you get there is um, every year like novel, new, cool um, technologies and techniques but there is also this open question about how generalizable the results are. And in particular with musical tabletops, there is a lack of formal studies. So this work contributes um, to, on the one hand, this third wave in HCI, and on the other, um, to the evaluation at nine. Right, in terms of motivation, it's also twofold. Um, it looks into uh, the potential of these um, tabletops uh, for music performance contributing to the democratization of musical creation and on the other um, the potential also in, in supporting sketching collaboration and I'll also unfold these two aspects. So with novel technologies in music um, there has been what is called a democratization of musical creation in the sense that there is less need of having a musical background of, or hours of practice in order to create music. And so part of it is because it's possible to create more constrained instruments that can support uh, beginners. And also, I mean, there are explorations about supporting uh, groups of, of, of users creating music together, whilst with traditional in instruments it's more like individual-led. Now this picture here is inspired by um, a piece comp uh, and which is called Imaginary Landscapes uh, Number 4 by the composer John Cage back in the 50s. And this piece, um, it's seen as a seminal work of network music and it's basically um, designed for 24 performers and 12 uh, radio units. And so each pair of performers is in charge of one, one of these radio units. One, in, one uh, controlling the frequency and the other controlling the amplitude. And so in this piece we can see commonalities with what you find on interactive tabletops for music, right? One is um, this idea of um, division of labor and another aspect that you find here is like this interdependency between musicians uh, in terms of um, controlling the sound output and also some compromises that you need to make. Now another relevant concept here is sketching music understood as um, interactive systems that support musical ideation in the sense that as, he, as when you are writing ideas with a pen on a notebook 
and that in music implies a real-time system, typically a looping system, which um, in a way has some implications for music performance. And so you are, while you are ideating, you're also creating a, a real-time music performance. <laughs> This connects to a famous quote by Bill Baxton, uh, referring to three levels of um, interaction and the idea of uh, when, when thinking about designing a user interface, starting from the standard spec, moving to the military spec, up to the artist spec as the most difficult to satisfy. Now, if you can satisfy the artistic spec, then everything else is easy. And this connects in a way with this idea of supporting sketching music and, and the difficulty and complexity that it implies. Before starting uh, the PhD at the OU, I went there first as a visitor researcher and we, the idea was there to explore the possibilities of collaboration on musical tabletops and in this case the idea was to port um, a multi-track recorder for mobile devices up to uh, an interactive tabletop, the Microsoft Surface in this case. And so there were like these design decisions about uh, how to support um, you know, multiple users and so then dividing uh, the different tasks. So here we see two, two modules, one module more focused on playing and, and recording and the other more into mixing. But from this work, there were more open questions than, than answers. And one was how to support both beginners and experts when uh, typically beginners expect or prefer like the collective experience and experts prefer um, a sophistication and yet yeah, sophisticated control of the interface. So all of this um, help us to shape the overarching research question of this work, which basically is what are the challenges and opportunities that these systems uh, can offer uh, between, and, yeah, between beginners and experts. In terms of background, there are three main legs. One is computer-supported collaborative work and tabletops um, in order to get a sense of the practices uh, on, on, on these devices. The other is computer-supported collaborative music in order to understand these practices within a musical context. And finally, tangible user interfaces as uh, like, you can, like you can see interactive tabletops as a subset of, of TUIs and so getting a sense of you know, main characteristics of TUIs that can inform interactive tabletops research. And so for CSCW, uh, which tend to be like systems that support collaboration, which can be collocated or remote, and also simultaneously or, or asynchronously, um, we are focusing here on collocated synchronous interaction. Now there are these three main um, terms that I would like to highlight as relevant. Uh, one is territoriality, understood as the space that is shared between the group of users. And typically in the literature they explain that the, the space next to the, next to the person uh, tends to be used as individual space, whilst the center of, of, of the shared interface is more for, for the collective um, experience, and then also there is the storage space. Now, thinking on this territoriality, there, there is this distinction between individual and group work, and so um, how to support transitions, fluid transitions between the two spaces. There are also questions about whether interferences between, between the two are beneficial or not. And also there is an open question whether constraints versus non-constraints um, are beneficial or not. And in this work, um, we show that as not using non, non, so not having constraints can be beneficial for, for the music performance and music improvisation. And in terms of workspace awareness, is another key term that refers to the up-to-date up understanding of what you are doing versus what others are doing. And so in the musical context also implies understanding your individual voice versus other person voices. 
And connected to that, there is real-time feedback, which basically these systems tend to provide uh, information about the user's actions. And it tends to be uh, using visual feedback, sometimes combined with haptic feedback, and less, less frequently you find auditory feedback, which is in one of the studies we explore providing auditory feedback um, for supporting workspace awareness. Another area that is relevant here is computer support with collaborative music systems, which are systems that support uh, creating music in group. And similar to the CSCW, you, you can find collocated or um, distributed musical instruments for that, and also supporting synchronous and asynchronous collaboration. So here we are focusing on four examples on collocated synchronous interaction just to get you a sense of how they look like in music. So at the top left, we can see a piece, um, well, it's more than a piece can be mentioned or referred to as a musical instrument, the SoundNet, <clears throat> built by Bill Bongers, which is a big web uh, with ropes, uh, large scale um, instrument. And so there are sensors at the top, uh, motion and stretch sensors, and so there is this trio sensor band, who is a, a famous band that works with uh, gestural interaction and sensors, who climb this web. And so they create music while climbing, and there is this idea of um, inter interdependence between the musicians. Now on the top right, we see the squeezables, which is a musical instrument designed by Gil Weinberg, director here at the Georgia Tech um, Center for Music Technology and GAN. And so this instrument is based on six squeezable balls that you can squeeze and stretch and the sound output uh, depends on the interrelation of these squeezes of different balls. And there are two roles. One is the accompaniment balls, there are six of them, and the uh, melo melodic ball. And in a way you see here like this idea of um, propo proposing roles within a musical instrument, but also this, this um, project is designed for beginners. And at the bottom left, we can see the reactable, and it is, as, can be considered as a CSCM system. And the idea here is that you, with these objects, you can create either um, individual, um, say, individual threads or shared threads. And with this idea of shared threads, there is, again, this uh, notion of uh, inter interconnection and interdependence between musicians. Finally, at the bottom right, we see an example of um, a mobile ensemble, and in this case, the Michigan Mobile Phone Ensemble. And basically, the idea is that um, a group of musicians in performance uh, each uh, has one uh, mobile device, and the sum of all of them can create the, the musical piece. So in CSCM uh, systems, there are also key terms. One is this idea of the expertise. And so um, whether you design them for beginners or experts or both, and also the relationship between, between these groups, whether it should be a more hierarchical relationship or more, a more egalitarian relationship. And so in this thesis, we are focused on supporting both beginners and experts, trying to provide an egalitarian setting. As I mentioned before, another distinction is this matrix of space versus time, this collocated versus distributed performers, and versus synchronous and asynchronous interaction. And yeah, as I mentioned, we focus on collocated and synchronous. Another aspect is the privacy. The systems can provide private spaces versus public spaces. Uh, they can provide both or just one, either, either one of the two. And connected to that, uh, how the audio delivery um, is displayed is also um, relevant. So whether you're providing personal or a short acoustic space, meaning that you are using headphones and or speakers. Now this work focuses on just public space, which is like this shared interface. And in terms of audio delivery, we're working with speakers generally, except one study uh, in which there are also headphones. You'll see later. Finally, tangible user inter interfaces. 
uh, which can be defined as um, um, systems that uh, work with physical objects that have digital uh, content embedded. And so here in a musical context, um, you can see three examples. On the left there is the audio detach, which is a top webcam system uh, that works, works with blocks on a sheet of paper. And in this case, it's a music sequencer. So depending on where you position the blocks, you create uh, uh, like the music. And on the top right, we see music bottles, another, another system based on bottles that trigger sounds. And finally, on the top, sorry, bottom right, we see the siftables, which is based on a, this idea of a constructive building blocks that can be uh, interconnected between them. They have a embedded, an embedded display. And so this idea of constructive building blocks um, is relevant in this, in this this is work as a way of creating uh, from basic to complex structures and so that you can um, support on, a, in, on, one, on one hand learning but also both beginners and experts. Now keywords here, one is seamless coupling with these systems you will expect that the physical and digital layers are nicely embedded but also this um, idea of, of using physical objects and multi multiple, multiplicity of them, uh, promoting a way hands-on hands -on environments, social interaction, and shareability. Now, another key aspect is this situatedness, which basically uh, refers to this um, meaning-making uh, and meaning constructed in group in particular situations. And also this recalls to uh, situated action by Lucy Sachman and this idea that um, the situation and the group of people and the technology play a key role in, in meaning making. Okay, moving to part two, which is more about the empirical work. Just an overview first. So, as I mentioned before, we conducted three studies and the idea being was to first explore what's already there with a commercial tabletop, the reactor, to see and observe what are the potential issues and then that, that would inform us to uh, do a, a third study and explore more particular questions. And, but a common denominator was that we wanted to do a non-intrusive observation and also we wanted to observe music performance as an open task rather than a constrained task. And so that's why we, we observe musical improvisation on these devices. Uh, for the museum study, that means casual interactions. In terms of methodology, I won't um, go very deep, but just explain the overall approach. Um, you can always refer to the thesis for um, like a more detailed account. Now, the main research tool used was video, which is um, widely used in social settings for understanding group of users interacting with technologies. Just to mention a few examples, uh, we find video used for understanding per programming or operating theater or serious games. Uh, video uh, overcomes what is named or called the Seidu problem that sometimes um, users report what they did, but sometimes it contradicts what they actually did. So video captures what people actually do. Another benefit is that it, video can capture both verbal and nonverbal communication, which is relevant here as music performance tends to be a nonverbal communication um, activity. Now, a criticism could be that camera influences the behavior of the users, but in a music performance context in which musicians are used to being recorded and watched, that's not um, that relevant. And in terms to overcome the a criticism of that video can be highly time consuming, we try to have very focused research questions and just um, analyze a subset of video extracts. And another criticism can be that um, the researcher can be quite biased about the, the findings and interpretations, but also video allows you to have group discussions in team, which we did. And 
we were fortunate to have uh, on board Eva Hornecker and Paul Marshall, who are experts in video analysis, and, and we could have a number of discussions on, on the videos. We also could share our video data um, for study two into workshops with experts in museums. Now, first study. Um, this was conducted at the Music Technology Group in Barcelona. And the results were published at the Tokai Journal and also presented at CAI. The main rationale was that we wanted to observe long-term interactions in professional settings and we wanted to capture real situations and the high ceiling, uh, which contrasts with observing basic interactions with, uh, you know, like uh, early on prototypes. So the approach was to use a complex system, the reactable used by expert musicians, and we were interested in observing changes over time and development over time. This is the reactable that uh, we use for the study. As you can see, it has a rounded shape, it measures around 100 centimeters of diameter, and you have like a rim area for positioning the objects. We work with about 40 objects. And so behind the scenes, um, just an overview, but it basically um, it works as a rear diffuse illumination technique, meaning that everything happens below the tabletop surface. So we have uh, like one part of the system captures uh, the position, location, uh, rotation of the objects using a camera connected to a, to a computer vision software, in this case Reactivision, and then um, a reactivation sends three messages about these objects to a tree application that deals with the behaviors of the different objects. And then there is this um, model, module that projects and, and provides audio, audio feedback as well. In terms of usage of the reactable, there are four main um, categories of objects. One is the sound generator, which um, basically creates sound. So if you put a sound generator on the tabletop, then you are creating a sound already. And, and then there are um, the, the field, and sorry, the sound uh, generators have um, square shape. Then we have the sound effects, we have a, we, which have um, a rounded square shape. And then we have controllers, which are rounded, and the global effects, which have a polygon shape. Now, these objects have a different number of inputs and outputs. You can interconnect them together. They can either send audio or control signals. And you are creating when uh, you are creating threads that I mentioned before, which can be seen as audio tracks. And the sum of all of them create a patch. Now, there is this middle pulsing point in the middle, uh, which basically has a double purpose. One is to indicate the tempo of the song, and the other represents, it represents the, the overall sound output. So you could position a, a filter, say, on top of it and affect the overall sound output. And another important characteristic of the reactable is what is called dynamic patching, which basically refers and connects to this idea of that it is, so basically what it is is that um, connections are, are done automatically. So if you position the objects on the table, they connect automatically to the nearest um, objects. So you don't need to worry about that. So you can control it, but I mean, there is a nice um, support in terms of how the objects are connected. And so this relates to this idea of editing and playing at the same time or building and playing at the same time and, and that idea of, um, of sketching music in real time. Now for the study, like we work with four groups of, um, of musicians ranging from two to four people for it. And we ask them to improvise music for four long sessions yeah, here you see the details. <clears throat> and in terms of findings, we'll summarize just a couple of vignettes for each of the studies. Uh, one, one finding was about the development of workspace awareness over time. So uh, we found that at the beginning there were more workspace awareness issues in terms of understanding what one person was doing. 
And so here we see the misuse of an object, the, program, the programmer object, while towards the end there was more control. And this vignette shows that, um, we call it preview technique. So considering that the reactable doesn't have any way of pre-listening the sound, we found that some, some musicians explore the idea of creating threads uh, without them being played, and once they were happy with the configuration, then they started to play. So we're gonna watch a short video of each of these two vignettes. So this yeah, programmer object at the top is not doing anything, but was the musician aware? When it highlights, the, so the light means that it's working, the thread is working. Anyway, another finding was mimicking over time, referring to musicians replicating physical movements from others. And so here we see an example uh, from group two, in which musician two in session one started to explore a technique with an object, in particular this technique that I mentioned before about positioning a filter in the middle of the table and affecting the overall sound output. And then musician two kept doing it in session two. And in session three, musician three started to explore this technique too differently, uh, like strobing or dragging the objects. And finally in session four, we found that musician one also started to use it. We are gonna watch one short video for each of the musicians exploring this technique. So this area of mimicking, um, like this technique only happened with this group, but it didn't happen with other groups. Other groups uh, learn or mimic other techniques, which points to not only peer learning, but also situate, situated peer learning, referring that each group solves problems differently and in different contexts. And we also mentioned um, or connect this to the idea of communities of practice, but rather than communities of practice between experts and, 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 and novices or apprentices, uh, we refer to this idea of, of peer learning and communities of practices based on, on peers. Okay, so moving to study two, which was conducted at the Intech Science Center in Winchester, which is in south of England and they have a permanent exhibit, the reactable there, for uh, supporting um, com the learning of uh, computer music principles. 
the main rationale was to explore casual interactions in public settings, and we were also interested in, um, in facilitating fluid transitions between groups in, in contrast with uh, those exhibits that uh, only promote one group at a time and, and transitions between groups are clumsy. So our approach was, again, to use a complex system that reactable used by users, and we were interested in um, understanding and giving some um, structure to these transitions. So we use this term, social cultural term called liminal spaces, which allow us to understand uh, these changes uh, of not only spaces, but also um, states. And so this is the reactable that uh, we work with. As you can see, it has a like, uh, customized rim area in which there are text labels that and also icons that indicate what is the function of each of the objects. Apart from the speakers embedded in the tabletop, um, there were like four um, um, headphones attached to them too, so that would allow a more intimate experience with, with, them, with the sound. And next to the, the table there was a TFT uh, monitor showing some, some snippets about how can you interact with, with this device. In terms of the study details, we, um, we went uh, in the wild and captured uh, video recordings during two days and four slots. So, um, and so we collected uh, data from 54 groups, uh, including 174 people. And so in terms of findings, one interesting um, um, finding we encountered was a synchronous interaction. So there were occurrences about not only synchronous interaction between groups, but also synchronous interaction. Uh, meaning that, as you can see in this image, um, there, a group just left a patch playing and moved to another exhibit. And after a while, another group approached the table and continued that patch. And this recalls this idea of um, um, Calabrix Keys, the Calabrix Keys game, which basically is a collective uh, drawing game in which you start uh, to draw and pass, pass it over to the next person, and that person continues drawing and so forth. And you never see the overall picture, but it's a collective, I mean, at the end there is this collective drawing. And it also has connections to the uh, post-it interfaces in which uh, you leave a message and then move on, another person can read that message and continue. And, and so this idea of yeah, synchronicity um, and, and, collect, and collaboration. Another finding was about this workspace awareness issues in early interactions. And, and so in this case, uh, considering that for the objects to be tracked for, uh, by the system, uh, usually the objects have a, like a, a attack, say, or a fiducial in this case, and you need to face the object correctly so that the system can track and understand which, which is the object. Now, you can see in a video that we're going to watch now that objects most, many times were facing up, uh, but the group, groups didn't seem to care much or, you know, be aware of it. We're going to watch now. Sure. <laughs> Okay, and also at this point, considering that this table, tabletop is in a museum context supporting uh, uh, the learning of computer music uh, principles and ideas, there is this open question whether, you know, this group for example, are they learning computer music? Or how could, could we improve it? 
Now for study three, this was conducted at the Open University and uh, we present the results at NIME conference as a long paper. And the rationale mainly was to, how, to try to solve or explore how, to, how can we support better these workspace issues in our interactions. And so we wanted to use an unintrusive, low-cost, ecological and scalable approach. Ecological referring to, referring to, so trying to provide a system that shouldn't constrain the number of users and the position of the users. And we also wanted to promote both individual and group work and support heterogeneous groups like uh, gender mixed groups and um, the different experience level uh, in terms of music. So our approach was to explore the use of everyday sounds which everyone is familiar with and, and the special cues that they, they imply and, and people are used to it. And we wanted to explore this connection between spatial dimension of everyday sounds and, and the spatial object position. So we went for um, using the ambisonics, which is a surround sound system, and using four loudspeakers loud is like a low-cost approach, and of the available surround sound systems is sort of like the <coughs> most um, realistic one compared to quadraphonics or stereo panning. And so this is, we built a do-it-yourself tabletop at the OU, uh, it was made uh, by boot, well with boot, as you can see here. Uh, we call it boot and tabletop, but people, some people call it um, Doctor Who table. And yeah, still wondering whether that was a positive or negative <laughs> um, attribute. But anyway, and we, as you can see behind the scenes, we were following the same diffused illumination technique as the reactor putting out everything below. And so, as you can see in the drawing on the left, the idea was that the sound output was dependent, dependent on the angular position of the object and the distance of the object from the middle point of the center. And yeah, we used basically a super collider for the visual and the, the sound engine. Um, and using an implementation of ambisonics, PAN B2 and decode B2, and set of wire to communicate with reactivation. In terms of the sounds, uh, we um, created six categories of sounds based on a taxonomy proposed by Rusolo in 19, 1913, based on a, a classifying urban and industrial sounds. And so we had like explosions, percussions, screeches, voices, whispers, and whistles. And we used uh, the free online database FreeSound to choose six sounds for each of these categories. And we had the help of, the, of Gerard Roma, who is an advice, who is an expert in this, in this database. In terms of usage, uh, we tried to replicate the reactable model, but like more, um, like more basic, and with this idea of having cubes representing the categories of sounds. So white cubes would represent these these sound categories, and so each face would have uh, one one sound of, of of these categories. And then we had like four um, filters represented by the black cubes, which were affecting. Um, to the next white cube, right? Just to also have like some um, more interesting sound outcomes. In terms of the study, uh, we work with eight groups of four people, which is challenging. I mean, typically there are studies with three, three people for group. We went for four just to explore um, how it went. And we wanted to expose the groups to two conditions, the spatial condition versus the non-specialization condition uh, in a randomized way. And so here you can see um, how the data looked like and how the, the music um, instrument sounded. Yeah, it's okay. 
<laughs> now, in terms of results, um, um, so we found that irrespective of the condition, well, we, we analyzed the, um, the amount of, of verbal communication for each group, and irrespective of the condition, there were more uh, group dynamics in the sense that we found groups that were more, um, we call them like storytellers, versus those who were more music performers, and they spoke less. We also analyzed the space use uh, of the tabletop under the two conditions, and again, for some groups, there was no difference at all. For others, like say G3 and G4, for example, they, there are more explorations of the individual space uh, under the SP condition. And for groups G2 and G, G7, um, they are exploring more the uh, in-between spaces compared to the NSP. But then also, like there is, yeah, this open question about. Um, how this individual versus group works um, are related to this specialization um, in which you know uh, individual individual it's more relevant so individual space affects more and you can notice more the specialization uh, compared to when you are positioning objects at the center. We transcribed uh, the conversations of the groups and we found that under the SP condition. Uh, there were more occurrences about how realistic the, the sound, outcome, sound outcome was. So here we see a quote in which they are exploring the sound of a campfire um, and well, yeah, of, yeah, crackles of a campfire. And so they are exploring the position of this sound, uh, the corner. And so there is this idea that the fire sounds really nice. It sounds as it is, as it is actually fire. It seems realistic. And also comparing um, the two conditions, we found more occurrences about um, musical immersion under the SP condition. So whilst in the NSP people were saying things like, for a moment something nice, we are very close to a preview performance. In the S SP condition people were saying things like, I think we have reached some musical plateau, it's music now, we should record a song like this and we've arrived, we are doing Stockhausen now. Now, part three, kind of a summary. So after all this work, then it comes the question of, so what? And basically, um, the implications of this work inform tabletops and HCI and CSC and nine communities. So in HCI, we have shown in a way that uh, this ta interactive tabletops can support peer learning and situated collaborations. We've seen that um, group dynamics are important and it's important to support them. And we've seen that um, it's, it's promising to explore more the, like creating immersive and ecological experiences uh, that can be used in experimental studies or learning environments. Uh, so we've seen uh, for the NIME community that uh, collaborative music promoting egalitarian and flexible roles can be promising and also that auditory feedback is an interesting avenue for supporting worst spirits awareness uh, within a music performance context too which is uh, quite challenging because there's already auditory feedback. In terms of future work, um, there are three main areas that can be explored even farther. One is this idea of how to support long-term tabletop learning. And the other would be, as we saw in, 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 the museum, in the last vignette in the museum study, so how can we learn computer music in casual interactions? How, how can we support that better? And also, how can we design more immersive and ecological experiences? Finally, these are um, my current interests, just to mention that they are very um, linked and attached to uh, the direction of your sketch. And, and yeah, this idea of building participation, exploring more, you know, the potential of tangible user interfaces in music performance and STEM education. And, and yes, that's basically it. So thank you very much for listening and I'm happy to take any questions or suggestions you may have.
No questions? Have you thought about how they can be more more accessible to the common people, to non musically inclined people as a sort of a, a sort of like maybe a social interaction tool or education tool? Do you mean? I'm sorry. Do you mean? Uh, uh, how cost prohibitive? How cost prohibitive? They will have. Well, they tend to be cost. Uh, they tend to cost, but the idea would be: Do you mean how to explore this supporting collaboration so, with? So are there ways to are there ways to reduce the cost so that they become more accessible? Well, you could always. Um, there is a uh, talk, nice talk here I give you about uh, exploring collaboration using uh, tablets rather than tabletops. So you could uh, prototype with tablets. I would say, yeah. This. Yeah, but this is a criticism with the interactive tabletops that in the end they, very, they are very costly. And so that's why, I mean, there's not that much research in the end. But yeah, I would say that you can explore with, with tablets a prototype and then prices have reduced though. And, and so but you could build one with by you know spending about a thousand dollars something like that. Oh. So at least the one that we built um, that I show you it cost about this price, including the yeah the computer. The participants that were enrolled in each of the stages, different stages, were they all musicians? So, in the three studies? Yeah, in all the studies, there were three, three to four different types of studies. Right? Yeah. So were they all, I know the first one were, were a set of expert musicians. So yes. Were the remaining musicians? Oh yeah, so in the second study they were visitors, so they were like, we, so it was an anonymous study, so we didn't collect data of the users, but you could see that they were ranging from uh, like kids, families, uh, students, but visitors expected as being non beginners, not experts in music at all. And for the last study, they were heterogeneous groups, so you could find beginners and experts mixed in, in the same group. Even the musicians, were they previously exposed to electronic music or were they just general instrument? So the type of music, do you mean? So for the two first studies, which were with the reactable, the type of music that you can create is sort of electronic music. And, and in synthesis basically, but you can load samples too like a virtual modular synthesizer. Now with the third study, they were like everyday sounds, like scratches or like the cat. Um, and which means that it was different, uh, a different way of approaching the music. But yeah. So, uh, what's this corollary of this? What you call home music? It's something like an improvisation. They have a group of musicians who are doing uh, a single performance and, and kind of playing around with the existing team. But at the same time, each of those uh, each of those performers is already a kind of an expert with a given instrument or a given style. So the uh, the performance is kind of a shared space where they kind of bring their individual expertise and kind of share them with each other. So I was curious if you played around with, with or if you thought about right? the notion of allowing individual performers to kind of stage up or step up their expertise in one aspect of the shared performance before trying to, to play together. So do you mean that that, that would be that would change about exploring the instrument alone and then playing together, you mean? I, I think it would. I mean you, you learn to play a trumpet on your own. 
but uh, in, in most of the studies that you showed us, people kind of all picked up different instruments and moved them around with different people. And they, they may never have gained true expertise in any one collection of things. And I'm just wondering if that would change the interactions, or if you're trying to go away from that. No, well, I mean, with study one, what I mean, with study one, which was with professional musicians, there were four groups. Three groups, they were sort of knowledgeable of the React code, which means that they already knew how to operate it, either with the iPad version or because watching videos. So in a way, they were knowledgeable about how. To, so it would cover perhaps what you are saying about already having like individual experience uh, performing with this instrument before gathering all together. And so there were three groups like this, and another which was completely beginners. And basically what we found with these three groups that were already knowledgeable uh, was that, well, they just uh, reached like more complex uh, configurations and techniques than, than the others. But we didn't want to go for like very much experts because then we couldn't, we were thinking that it wouldn't be possible to observe within four sessions like, uh, like this evolution or development that interesting. Yeah. Okay, I think we're out of, I don't know if this is working or not, I think we're out of time. Let's thank our speaker again. Thank you. Uh, and to uh, echo Richard's uh, sentiment, please make sure to leave no trace in this room. Anything you brought in, including food, garbage, whatnot, please take out.